Today we're going to be talking about this very rare unicorn find. So it's like I was away from home for a month and a half to nearly two months on this whole Moose Lago and Montball trip. And then I got back to setting up my GTR. What's my life? What's my life? Yeah. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Horsepower Cartel. This is the first of its kind. It's called Cartel Talk. It's a podcast, uh, video podcast, video cast, whatever you guys want to call it. Uh, and we have to have a very special guest. And uh, you guys, some of you guys already know him. His name's Imran Majid. Uh, we have to start out with the bang from a guy who gives out a lot of bangs. And uh, I'm gonna bang this one. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, let's talk about, uh, you know, first of all, you know, Imran, professional, ex-professional racer, used to race down um, with in the ITC, with the S-Team, Zens, and Honda Cities, you know, you name it. And uh, he has a workshop called Kickshift, located in South Bombay, in a personal, uh, you know, customization, tuning, performance, whatever you need, custom body work, restoration, and uh and he also deals in cars as well so um today we're going to be talking about his very rare unicorn find this guy uh always early you know the term early bird gets the worm this guy's the eagle when it comes to you know being an early bird and he gets all the worms so uh <laughs> let's talk about that special v12 car that you got that luckily a lot of people were after but since you were the early bird, you happened to get it. So yeah, it's, it, um, it was a special car. It was a tedious deal, very tiring, um, super financially draining. <laughs> but yep, let's, let's get to the point. So I was out on a drive in the night uh, during the week before Eid, and I bumped into some friends of mine. And we got chatting and one of them offered me this beautiful V12 and showed me the pictures of the car and stuff. But he did tell me for the past five or seven years, this car hasn't been driven around. It's just been serviced and stuff regularly, but no one's there to drive it. The owners are abroad. So I was like, fine, let's, let's talk about it tomorrow. So we got talking the next day. Um, I, I, I negotiated the price with him. He happened to confirm the price ahead with the sellers. And we were supposed to leave on Saturday, but then Sunday was Eid. So we decided to leave on Monday morning. So Monday morning, we got on, we got on a 6.30 flight, got to Delhi. I was expecting us to go straight from the airport to the car, see the car, uh, check it out, check the papers out, transfer the money for the car and hopefully load her the same night or the next morning at least and send her back to Bombay. That's normally how I, I operate, you know, I, I negotiate my price before I get there and the price is obviously in the term once we see the car and it's up to the mark of what was discussed. So when we reached there, we were told that we'd have to wait till the afternoon or evening to go see the car. So we checked into a hotel, checked in for a night Chilled, went, met some friends at GD Tuners. The boys asked me what I was doing there. So I told them I'm here to buy a V12. And before I could say anything, one of them just sprang up and said, oh, is it a Merc? <laughs> so I was like, yeah, yeah it's a Merc. It's a W222 S600. I was like, oh yeah, yeah, the black one with Mokka interiors, UP register. And I was like, yeah, yeah, just that one. How do you know the car? And he was like, oh, no, no, I've seen the car around and stuff. So I was like, yeah, yeah, I've spoken for the car and stuff. So Monday went by. We, we didn't get to see the car. Um, Tuesday afternoon, we were called to go see the car. We uh, fired the car up. There's a lot of smoke coming out from the exhaust. Um, with the staff, even I panicked at first, but I got out, I smelled the fumes, and it was a lot of unburnt fuel and stale fuel. So the injectors basically had got clogged with jelly and stuff. And um, I knew it was just fuel and I had to clean the fueling system and stuff. So I took the car out of the house to go for a drive down the road, uh, pushed her a bit, 
She started responding better, stopped fluttering that much. The smoke stopped coming out. I got back to the bungalow while I was getting into a group of people outside standing on the road. So they looked like bystanders, enthusiasts looking at the car, but there were two or three of them taking videos over there. So I parked the car and didn't think anything of it. When they said, okay, tomorrow we'll give you the account details, we can go ahead with the deal, blah, blah, blah. And the same night at about 10, 30, 11, I get a call. Like, not me, my friend gets a call from the guy he negotiated the car with and said, oh, someone else in our office has got a deal, has got an offer on the car that is um, five lakhs higher than the price you guys have offered us. And now our boss has told us to hang on for a day and see if there's any other offer on the market. So I immediately upped the offer by another five and told the guy, you know what, I offered you X, you've got five up, I'm giving you five more, so that's 10 up from what we've spoken, let's just close it, let's not wait. For anything, I need to get back to Bombay. I've got work pending over there. So this was Wednesday, and Thursday morning they called us up. They told me that, oh, you know what, we've got another five increase by the person, and it's someone from the south negotiating and offering us, and they've offered us five more than you now. So I got a little high road, and I was like, you know, what the hell is going on? I've wasted my time, come here, I'm three nights in here. I've stayed at a hotel for three nights. I don't know what the end result of this is. And I just went 12 to 14 lakhs higher than what anyone had offered to make sure I close the deal and just get it done. So I gave them the ultimatum. I said, this is my offer right now. And you give me your details right now. I make the payment and I take the car the same day. So they got back to me at 2 to 15 in the afternoon and said, here are the account details. You can make the payment right now and it has to be done in today's day. So I, I, I found it a little strange because I was at Chhatrapur Farms and I couldn't really go all the way to Gurgaon or Delhi to a bank to get it done. Out of nowhere. Yeah, I was out of nowhere, bro. I was just chilling. And I called up my partner and I requested him to make this payment through his uh, corporate account that operates 24-7 because they, they deal with a lot of international clients and with firms and stuff. So they make payments across the night too. So I requested him and he was kind enough, he got it done. But when he said it got done at about 3, 3.30, there was no um, UTR or anything that even he had received from the bank, but he was pretty sure it would be done. So he said, man, don't worry about the night, we'll have it. I informed the office about the same and they waited till 7, 7.30 and then they also got a little jiffy about it. Um, and they called me and they said, you know, we're leaving work. So there's no delivery today. If your money comes in before 12 in the night, great. Or we give the car to the other person. I was like, fair enough. Like, let's... 12 the next day? No, 12 the same night. Oh. If my money doesn't reflect this very day, that's Thursday. Wow. Friday, they'll give the car to someone else. So I went to sleep in the night. And the next day was Friday. So I wake up a little late, pray my namaz and then start my day. So when I woke up at about 12, 12, 30, I had about four or five missed calls from these guys. And I again thought that, you know, it's either the payment hasn't gone to them or they said, oh, the other person has reached and also made the payment, now what do we do? And I thought it's gonna be another showdown or they wanna again now push the price higher. So I uh, called them back and informed them that it's Friday and you know, I'm gonna pray namaz and then only meet them for whatever. And they said, oh, so your money came in at 10.58 in the night. How did you manage to do this and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, don't worry about that. Just let me know when, <laughs> when delivery is. So they said, you can come right now. And I was, I, I was like, I'll pay namaz, go eat lunch and stuff and reach by 4.35. So we reached the house about 5, 5.30. I took Vidit with me. And I told him, come, we'll go. I've bought a car. Let's go take delivery finally. So he was also expecting a S600. <laughs> So we reached this bungalow and he's like, dude, there's a, a Ventura, there's a Musilago also in this villa. So I looked at him and I said, bro, that's the only car in this villa and that's what we've come to buy. Like we've bought and we're taking now. So we went there, we did all the documentation and stuff. We did organize a flatbed to get it flatbedded back to GT. Because I wanted to get the fuel system cleaned and stuff, get her checked once, check if there are any oil leaks, anything like that. So we took her there, we gave her a run through, gave her a scan over there, checked everything out, she was perfect. Now when we did GT, that's when Vidit, like on the way, told me that, oh, there's a friend of ours, Rauer, who's coming on the mod ball run. 
And he, in fact, was negotiating on this car for six months and said, I'm buying the car and I've bought it and stuff. And in fact, Imran, he in the morning has told us that he's on his way to Delhi to pick up this car. So what is the scene? Have you bought it or are you just servicing it or what's the scene? I said, bro, I've bought it. And this is what went on these four or five days. So he called up Zaravar and he told him that, you know, oh, bro, Imran's bought the car. And he had no idea that you were the opposition uh, bidding on the car too. And nor did you know it was him or that you guys could have discussed it. But while I bought the car, got it, we serviced it and stuff. And Vidit and me took it out for a spin that night, drove about 60, 70 kilometers, went back to my hotel. I'd moved into the Rosiette by then. We were staying there. Went in, parked the car, I went fresh enough. We were all supposed to eat dinner at the bar downstairs and celebrate the Mursalago. So I uh, happened to be showering and Zarawar called and said, do you mind if I come to the hotel and see the car? And I was like, most welcome to see the car. And I even wanted to meet him because we'd been talking for the past three, four months over various cars and stuff, discussing stuff. So he came in with a friend of his and stuff. He asked me if he could sit in the car, start the car. He sat in it, he tried starting it, it didn't start at first. And I got in the car and it, it started up with me. <laughs> it's so, like one of those things in Transformers. Yeah, no, so basically, so, the car, no, no, no. the car chooses you. So, <laughs> to be honest, basically, there's a way to start, start the Mustalago up. How there, there was a kill switch oh. that you had to put on. From factory? Yeah, from factory. Ooh. There's a kill it's switch in the, in, the, in the boot. Yeah, yeah. So, I went, I turned it on, I sat and I started it and I kind of tried joking with him saying, you know, she only wanted to start by me. <laughs> So anyway, then he sat, he looked at the car, and while just looking at the car, I was a little confused. Because I was like, is he reminiscing the car? Is he just checking her out? Or is he looking at her in details to negotiate with me to buy the car? He got out and he was like, dude, I was like after this car for six months and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I've even got the payment with me in the car and calm. I was supposed to reach their office, but your payment reached in the night. They told me. So, I know how much you bought the car for and can I pay you this price for it? But he unfortunately didn't know what I actually paid for the car because he upped it 5.5, five, that was 10, I'd already gone up 15 by then. And then I slammed it another 14, 15 lakhs more, so that was about 25, 30 more already in. So I informed him and I said, this is the message, this is my payment receipts and this is the payment I made. And this is what it is, champ. And I'm not interested in selling the car right now because I want to take it back to Bombay. I got to show it to my brother. I want to show it to Hormaz. I want to show it to Sani. I want to take it on our cartel drive. I wanted to go. Yeah, you're, you're planning a whole yeah we're doing a delivery video. and a Sunday drive and breakfast and stuff. And a lot of the spotters here and a lot of the enthusiasts here really wanted to see the car and I was aiming to get it back to show it to them and then sell it to anyone. So I happened to be driving around on the fourth day in Delhi Two, three days I drove around. We went on the Sunday drive in Delhi. DJ asked me to take him for an all beans drive, which I hadn't done yet. I have to see that. Yeah. So I put him in the Corsa and we went for a flat out drive. We hit fourth gear and I heard and I felt a cylinder misfire. So we pulled up, uh, pulled over. I, I felt her misfiring. Then we drove her a bit more and she started smoking. Unburned fuel again. I thought, oh, it's an injector or something blown now. So we took her back to GD, we scanned the car, it was one of the, the ignition coils that had blown. And when we opened the whole stack, we realized that 10 were Lamborghini coils, 2 were R8 coils. And this car was recently serviced at the Lamborghini dealer. So I, so I don't think anyone checked that, it was just an oil change they did or whatever, but nobody had looked into it. Fortunately in Delhi, um, these friends of mine hooked up the ignition coils, the set of 12 and spark plugs and we replaced all of that stuff, put it on the car, fired it up again. She drove like factory after that. She had done only like 4,000 KMs on the Odo on the car. Yeah, that's not so, so she was barely anything on the Odo. And um, we took her out again for a drive that night. Instagram went really viral, a lot of spotters in Delhi put the car up on Instagram and stuff. And I got a random call from another person who I knew who also does deal in cars. And he said, oh, there is a customer interested in your car. He knows you well enough. Not personally, but he knows of you well enough. You guys share a lot of common uh, cars in your garages that you all have for your personal collection. 
and he's really keen on the car. So can you, um, <coughs> would you be interested in parting with the car? By now, after going through the struggles to actually have this car running on my ninth day in Delhi, perfectly, I was a little f- irritated and I was like, you know what, this is the X price I want on the car. Take it or leave it. Take it or leave it. So he calls me back in 20 minutes and says, the, uh, the owner would like to just get, the buyer would like to get on a call with you for 30 seconds if possible. And he'd just like to have a word with you. So I was like, sure, he got me on the line. This person is a person with an amazing collection. He's got an amazing collection of cars and stuff. A lot of nice JDMs, not one. He's got two, two or three, three of each model in different specs. So he's got a beautiful garage and he spoke to me and he was very polite and a real gentleman. He said, I don't mean to negotiate with you on the price, but would this offer of mine do for you? Yes or no? I would not like to haggle haggle with you. The price he offered me was, again, decent enough. He respected the effort I did over the car. We chatted over it. I told him exactly what went through. I let him know my purchase price on the car, everything. And I said, you know, I've gone through all this. I've put in the money and I'd expect to make money on it if I want to give it off. So he was kind enough and he even agreed to the terms that I would get the car to Bombay, drive it, you know, show it to everyone and then pack it off to him. But yeah, it took about three or four days again for this paperwork to happen, everything to go through, uh, agreements to be made, documents to be placed in place, and the transfers to be done of the payment. So from a two-day trip in Delhi, I'm now on my 16th day in Delhi, which was amazing. I really started enjoying Delhi. I started enjoying the people I was hanging with. I started meeting more of the boys who were coming on the Modball crew. And they were all, they were all like pouring in from different cities in the country because they were all assembling there. Okay, so, so let's talk about the Modball crew, uh, the Modball run. Right. So, no, so wait. So when I started chilling there, I finally decided that I'm not coming back to Bombay and I'm just going to stay back and continue Modball, yeah. which was like eight days or nine days away. So I called up the buyer and I said, you know what, you've been really kind, you've agreed to everything, but I'd like to just ship the car directly from here to you because I'm not going to be in Bombay for another 25 days. I don't expect you waiting for the car for a month, month and a half. So he said, no, I'd even wait for that. It makes, it, I have no issues with that. I know you'll care for the car all this while and stuff and you can keep it. So I, I got the car detailed, I gave it a little ceramic coating on it and I packed it up and I sent it off. And then I stayed back from Modball. Now Modball initially started off with Sean telling Kabir he wanted to drive the R8 around the north for a few days. And Kabir happened to tell Vidit and Sahil. Vidit called me up and said, do you want to do this trip? And I jumped on it because there were the, I knew Vidit for the past 12 or 14 years. We used to race together. Kabir I had never met. Sean, of course, I've raced with a lot at the track. We've ridden bikes together, we've drag raced against each other, we've had a lot of fun. So, I, uh, I agreed immediately to get on the trip and it was five of us going on the trip and then we obviously started talking about it. And Vidit then called uh, me up and said, why don't you ask Santosh to come along on this trip? And that's when I asked you and you of course jumped on to the trip, you said yes and then you told the Weekend Talk boys and a few of them got on on the trip. There were a few boys from Srinagar who got on. So we suddenly became 12 to 15 cars and there was a lot of more interest coming in on the trip. So we decided that, you know, since this is no more just five friends going, let's uh, cap this at 20 or 21 performance cars, stage two plus, and let's call this the mod ball run. Let's call it just a modded car run, like a performance car run, where we drive from Delhi all the way to Leh through the Zojila Pass, do Khar Dungla and return back. Now, as you know, a lot of supercars have gone to Khardungla, but they've all been put in a truck. Flat they've they've there. been flatbedded through Zojila, taken eight or nine days to reach Leh and then drive up. But we wanted to do it with our cars and stuff, so we requested Kabir to go do a little recce, recce run, just through the whole of Zojila and come back. He took his E92. And so, yeah, he was really smart because just doing the recce, if he had gone and done it in a Thar or a Land Cruiser, 
you would really never know if the performance cars are going to make it through. Yeah. So technically, Kabir is the first um, performance car that I personally know that drove through the whole of Zojila and came back both ways without a support car, without a spare tire, Just without him anything. Him and a friend on a normal day. Yeah, him and a friend on a normal day left Srinagar, went through Zojila, came back and gave us a thumbs up on it. So we all, the five of us took onus on this trip to, you know, organize a support crew, flatbeds, the hotels, food arrangements, permissions, tourism permissions from the tourism departments because we performance cars going through the valley, it's a green zone. We were going to be loud. Obviously, we were all running uh, exhaust. exhaust and stuff, but we were all controlling our emission norms. We got our cat converters put on. Some of us had straight pipes and stuff, but we were obeying. We, we were respecting the villages when we'd pass through, we wouldn't really be rowdy. We'd drive really well. We were driving in a convoy and stuff. So, yeah, we, we stayed back. Everyone assembled in Delhi. And we flagged off from Delhi. We drove to Jalandhar. Jalandhar to Srinagar. We stayed in Srinagar. Went to Gulmarg for a night or two. Came back. Then we went to Sonmarg. And from Sonmarg, we continued to cross Zojila and the whole beautiful drive to Leh. And now, a little, a little funny story that I now think was funny, but um, all due respect to everyone's sentiments, I totally understand how someone must have felt thinking or misunderstanding the situation at that moment. But when we left from Sonmarg, we all left together, and the plan was that Sean and Sid would um, lead the pack, because in case in Zoji life they have any trouble, we're all there to, you know, pave the path for them and make sure their cars go through, even at the flatbeds behind us and stuff. Yeah. So we reached and we reached a little stream crossing that was pretty rocky and sharp rocks and stuff. So there were two boys guiding Sid through this stream and showing him the path. And he was getting a little slow, so Sean overtook him and found a cleaner path, a flatter surface, and crossed the stream, went across and stopped. I crossed the stream behind Sean and went across and stopped. And I was waiting in the car with Nirbha. We were chatting, we were having something to eat. I was a little hungry and stuff. And in that much time, in about 10 minutes, Sean came up to me and said, come, we'll continue. So we continued ahead. I thought everyone was following behind. There were three or four cars behind us that came also and stuff. I didn't notice Sid wasn't there with us behind me. I thought he's with the crew and stuff. But Sid has the 488, 488 stage two, no? Yeah, the 488 stage two. And we happened to cross Zojila. We crossed it. We reached the crossing of Zojila. And we came to a point where Sean, me, and two other cars, we reached first. We got out. We were chilling. We took pictures. And that's when uh, Sean actually told me that, oh, these guys are taking a little while. I think um, Sid's taken time to replace his tire. So that's when I got to know that Sid actually slid his tire on that stream crossing. And that's why we continued and he was waiting to change his tire. But it was normal. Like, every one of the 21 cars, we were only four here. There were still 16 cars behind. So we all got pictures of our cars, at the Zojila milestone and stuff. And Sean happened to post first ever supercar across Zoji La Paz. <laughs> and seeing that I wrote first ever supercharged, uh, ultra charged uh, S4 to cross the Zoji La Paz. And we posted it and we continued driving when two or three more cars came. We all got together and seven, eight of us drove ahead and we continued to lay. We reached lay, we checked into the hotel and stuff. We were chilling, we were having some snacks. And Sid came in and he came in to the balcony we were sitting in and he was re really upset and he was like, dude, this is not right, you, can't, you guys can't do that. I was, I was pretty like surprised or amazed as to what was going on, like why is he upset, what happened and stuff. And then he obviously voiced it and he said, we've come here as a team, as a family and you guys posted that you're the first guys to do this and stuff. And yes, I agree, it wasn't intentional, but I totally understand. Obviously, it was written first supercar, first supercharged, ultracharged car, but we tagged Mod Ball as a family because we were family doing it and stuff. So there was a little altercation over there, and then obviously we spoke about it. Sorted it Things out. were sorted out. It was clear that it wasn't a misunderstanding. And Sid was pretty upset that I drove away, but 
I explained to him that I had lost my walkie-talkie at Srinagar itself at the hotel or at some dinner we were at. And I didn't have a walkie-talkie for the whole trip from Srinagar to Leh. So I had no clue about it. And Sean only informed me at the milestone. And Sean seconded that too and explained to Sid it wasn't intentional or it wasn't something that we did on purpose and stuff. That got sorted. Next day we had plans for a flag off with the tourism ministers of um, Shri of uh, Leh with the SOH and all of them. And uh, a friend of ours who joined us on this trip who owned the Hotel Anjum, his family was there to flag it off and they organized a beautiful breakfast for us, a flag off. And the media was there and stuff. So we were leaving a car Dungla and we were given an escort where the roads were actually shut down for about 20 minutes where we were allowed to just drive up there in a convoy. And just you guys? Just us. Wow. So it was amazing. We drove up from Leh to Kardungla in about 20, 22 minutes from the center of the city. normally take, like an hour, hour, I think, hour? I think they say it takes about an hour, hour, 10 minutes. Wow. But we had the whole road clear. We had nothing. We just and had one roads. obstacle. Roads. Roads are tarmac. It's like a... Because the army uses the roads and it has to Yeah, it's like you're in Monaco, dude. Yeah. It's exactly like One Monaco. Pothole, Nothing. The next half an hour they fix it. In the next 10 minutes, a pothole is done. If there's a landslide, within three hours, the road is rebuilt, landslide uh-huh. cleared. It's amazing. So we drove up, and on the way up, Hormas told me, he said, you know, uh, don't smoke a cigarette on the way up. You're going to really um, lose lose oxygen and not going to breathe. Yeah, so, the so, so he was like, you're going to have problems and stuff. And I was like, homie, don't worry about me. You know, we'll we'll manage it and stuff. And we went up, we were chilling. We had something to eat upstairs, came back down. And we all decided to go to a bar in the night called Le Chen to celebrate that we've completed and accomplished our whole trip and the mission, the goal was accomplished. And no breakdowns on the way, like nothing. A tire slid, I don't even count as a breakdown because dude, going with 21 stage two performance cars, you expect one of them breaking down. None of them broke down. Well built, reliable cars by everyone. And they're modded too. Yeah, this crew but knew what modding a car is. There were no cheap ass parts on it, no no homemade bullshit on these cars. They were factory branded performance parts that were properly set up for these vehicles. So hats off to every boy who came on that trip who, who did their car up sensibly, spent that extra dime and got it done. So when we went, we went to celebrate and stuff. Everyone got hammered, they got, everyone got drunk over there. It was about 1.30 in the night, we got done drinking. And of course, first they were offered some local vodka and a whiskey called Gyan Chan. <laughs> and her homie flipped out when he saw Gyan Chan and then he saw the vodka and he was like, you know, we've got smoke vodka that was sponsored to us for our after party once we accomplish our drive and stuff. So they wanted to pull the smoke vodka out, but... This bar wanted cockage on it, which was like five or six thousand bucks per bottle, which was even more expensive than the bottle of smoke. So I told Hormaz that, do, do you guys really find it worth it? And they were like, for a damn sure, we'll even pay ten cockage, but we'll drink smoke, we ain't drinking anything else. So these guys stand three bottles of vodka, eight, nine of them, you're pretty hammered. And I was tired after the whole day, a few of the other boys were tired, and we decided to go back to the hotel, chill on the lawn for about an hour chit-chat, bonfire and stuff, and pass out. So we did that, and then Anjum um, got carried away with some of the boys who wanted to go now chill at a mountain top, which apparently you can see a whole lake from there. All and of uh, Srinagar? Uh, all of Leh. All of Leh, sorry. Yeah, like they could see some lake from there and stuff, or some kind of valley, and... <laughs> they decided to continue there. So four cars, 16 people went up there. And I don't think they realized that it was a no moon night. It was dark. It was dark as fuck over there. You couldn't see shit. And these guys went up point to go and see it. When they reached up there, they realized they couldn't see Jack. So they pulled out some more vodka and they sat there and they chilled and they were drinking vodka. Now I passed out at about 1.32. Or maybe I think 3 o'clock. At about 4, 4.30 in the morning, um, I heard someone like throwing up in the washroom in my room. So I woke up, I looked around, I didn't see Hormaz around, but I showered and I thought it was him. <laughs> so I showered out to homie. And he's like, yeah, yeah, it's me, it's me, I'm fine, but I'm just belching, I'm not throwing up and stuff. 
So he did that for about five, ten minutes. He's completely like. No, he was just in the washroom. I couldn't see him. I was in the room. But did you know that he was? No, I didn't know anything. Okay. He came. He lay down. He said, "No, no, I'm cool." <laughs> I shut my eyes. I passed out. I think after about half an hour, forty-five minutes again, I wake up to even louder belching in the bathroom. So I go. I'm like rubbing home. He's back, and he's like, "No, I'm, I'm not throwing up. I'm just belching. Nothing's coming out and stuff. I'm feeling really dizzy and stuff like that." So I asked him, "You know, are you like tired?" And he's like, "No, we went up. We drank more, and I think it's altitude sickness." Because we went up fifteen thousand feet or sixty, eighteen thousand feet to Kardumla, come down, and then they've gone up again thirteen thousand feet to another peak after drinking and drank more, and they've come down. So they haven't even climbed. They climatized over there. And Hormaz then again comes to the bed. He's chilling. Seven thirty-eight. Again, he's in the washroom, but this time he's thrown up. He's feeling dehydrated. He comes back. He's like, "I'm just gonna pass out now. I'm feeling a little better." So again, I passed out for a bit. I woke up at nine thirty. Ten went down for breakfast. At about eleven o'clock, Homie calls me up and says, "Can you please send me the oxygen can from the car? I think I'll feel a little better." So I requested Omar. So just go to the car, take the can, and go up to home. Me, so he said, "Yeah, even I feel like resting for a bit. I'll take the can. I'll go up." Now home, he calls me after forty minutes and says, "Dude, where's the can, man?" And like I'm really feeling sick. So I said, "Dude, I sent Omar upstairs," and he took the can. He's like, "Bro, he came in walking with the can, but he's finished it and he's passed out next to me. He's <laughs> as bad as me. Even he's sick." So. I I said okay I'm like organizing something he called me 10 minutes later and he he could see us down on the lawn so he sees a cloud floating above and he says can you see that cloud brother that your brother just about to float away <laughs> so I then realized that this guy is really unwell and he's feeling sick so I requested Anjum to call in a doctor and get an oxygen tank so I got one of those big ones so yeah yeah they got in a full on <laughs> hospital ICU Equip damn oxygen cylinder with a mask and a meter and stuff. Sent it up to the room. They gave him oxygen. I when I spoke to him, I asked him if he's fine. He was like, "I'm bad. I'm just gonna relax for a bit." And we continued for the day. We went out. We were chilling and stuff. When we were out and chilling, homie called us up after three four hours and was inquiring where we are. And we were at a cafe, sitting down to eat. So. He comes over then. He's obviously way better now. I'm chilling and stuff. And we had some food. We chill, spend the day with everyone. In the night when we went back to sleep, everything the lights are off. We're chilling. I'm like about to pass out. After about ten or twelve minutes, I hear like a hissing sound, like a. <laughs> and I turn around and Holma has put on the mask, the cylinders on, and he's like chilling and enjoying it. <laughs> so I take out my phone to take a video. He pulls his mask off and stuff. And hides it from me. So I go to the washroom, come back. While I'm coming back, I get a glimpse of him with his uh, oxygen mask on and stuff, and it was hilarious. And he was actually enjoying it, so he drained the whole tank the whole night on that. Wow. And then yeah, then we finished the trip in two days more in Leh. Came back to Srinagar. Homie and me stayed back with Kabir, Bilal, and Omar and Hani. They really took us around to some nice spots in uh, Srinagar. Got us to. Uh, see some amazing places. So we went on the houseboat on the Dal Lake and stuff. So it was fun. Wow. Came back to Delhi, stayed for three, four days, and then Homi and me flew back. We left the S4 there, and we came back to uh, Bombay. So it was like I was away from home for a month and a half to nearly two months on this whole Mursa Lago and Mount Ball trip, and then I got back to setting up my GTR, which is now finally prepped, ready. To go for it, we're aiming high. We're aiming for a really good run this time, and we're aiming to be really competitive and put on a good I, show I, for I've everyone. I've seen a lot of videos like of these. You know, you, you were nice enough to give some spotters a ride for uh, you know in the car. Yes, yeah, so I, I take these kids out because the car is moving. Yeah, the car, the car is now high. moving for sure. What I so did all, all this time, you ran a ten, three, ten, four, ten. Yeah, five. It, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was running with like multiple boost leaks and stuff, and and we we dropped the engine recently. We got all the boost leaks, packings, new bolts put on, talked them all up. 
you got all the intake packings, the tappet covers, the gaskets, everything replaced. Like if I've set it up totally like so, brand so new. So give you guys an idea. He ran whatever mid tens so far, on low boost. Oh, with oh, the leaks. So we've been running five psi boost even now. That's nothing. Like even now, right now with everything sorted out, running five psi boost. But she's now she's really gunning now. I just took some friends out last night for a drive, and it was mental. So I'm hoping to retune this weekend. She's running currently running a tune from 2017, and she's done so far so great with road tires on an S trip that had a lot of tar- tarmac rubble and stuff. So hoping for a good run this year at the Valley Run, and yep, once the run's done, she'll give you an insight on how we prepped, how we built, and what we've been doing with the car. You would add some people from. Alpha so we had we had we had the Alpha Logic. Um, head technician down here Malcolm who came down for three days uh, was here when I dropped the engine got everything repacked and stuff he was here to give us a complete go ahead that everything's fine now on the car everything's packed talk to the right talk and stuff and we set it back we even installed the brand new 2022 dis- uh, Datsun design uh, oh, gearbox so waiting for yeah so we've, we've gone all out on the gearbox now and um She's mental. Ready for, so this year in the Valley Run, guys, uh, shout out to Rongon, the 10th anniversary of uh, yep. the Valley Run, 11, 12, 13. 13 13th is going to be the final day on the Sunday where all the supercars are going to run. The final uh, runs are going to happen of the bigger cars and the more horsepower cars. We've got six GTRs running. Six GTRs, supposedly. And coming. we've even got the R33 from back in the day that holds a record time coming to compete with us. Yeah. So, so it's yeah. going to be a big one, guys. We hope to see you then. We hope to put on a good show for you guys. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, Mark, um, thanks for coming on. Uh, we uh, had a lot of obstacles to get this uh, podcast going, but hopefully we got it right this time for you guys. And we're going to have a bunch of these, Imran. Of course, we had to have him as the first person to come on here. And, uh, yeah, uh, see you guys soon. Like, subscribe, share. Let me know what you guys think about this whole concept of uh, cartel. Car talks. Cartel talk. And uh, we'll see you guys soon. Thanks for having me, Sani. And thank you all for watching us, hearing us, and staying, staying tuned through the whole podcast. Go like, subscribe, and share. And that's all Spark Cartel for you.